uh, I just want to welcome you. I want to say a, f a few uh, words about uh, Central uh, uh, Plan, and then going to introduce the moderator, who in turn is going to introduce the panelists and, and talk about uh, the, the subject of tonight's uh, event. In any case, uh, though we are closing on the semester, Centro still has a few more events to uh, forthcoming. I want to uh, call your attention to uh, two very important ones, the, the uh, exhibit and celebration of the acquisition of four major uh, collections for our archives. Uh, Herman Badillo, uh, I don't think I need to explain to this crowd who he was, but it's a great acquisition. It's, uh, uh, it was a lot of uh, work to get to it, and it's a very valuable collection. The same thing with Miriam Colon, who was the founder of the Puerto Rican Traveling Theater. Uh, and Victor Fragoso, who fewer people know of him, but he was a pioneer in New York theater, and he passed away of AIDS way you know, too young, uh, but had a great impact uh, in, in the community here. He died of AIDS and at the time was not diagnosed and he captured all that struggle through his writings to the grandmother. So we acquired all that collection, it's a fantastic collection. Uh, and finally, Tato La Viera. Tato La Viera is, is a major uh, acquisition for us. You know, obviously we only, many of us knew Tato. Tato is the, the you know, the dean of uh, New York Rican poetry and he was founder of the New Eureka Movement, and it's a, it's a beautiful collection. We have published a book uh, about his writing. Uh, the Central Journal has plenty of articles about his legacy and his contribution. And in addition to the collection, we also are sponsoring a one-hour documentary to go along with Fran Bonilla, Purotre, and other documentaries that we have, and the showing, the premiere of that will be uh, in May as well, uh, uh, May 3rd. And the mother of all events will be the Diaspora Summit. Many of you have attended the Diaspora Summit. It's a two-day conference, and it has become uh, de facto uh, the place where the diaspora meets. We have already scheduled about 25 panels and two or three plenaries. Each person in those panels, with four or five at a time, represent a different organization. We never have a, you know, an organization send two people or one person do two panels. And so that means that we have over 100 organizations that are represented in the diaspora. In the last few years, we get 10 or 12 states represented. Uh, at any given point, you have hundreds of people there, and over the weekend, over 600 people show up in, at one point or another. So this is a great event. I encourage you all to, uh, to be with us. And um, before I talk about Hector, I know it's a great occasion because my wife is joining us, and so welcome. And, uh, and, and, and it, she only attends very special occasions, so I want to tell the two authors that, that you're, uh, you're uh, blessed with her presence here. Okay. And uh, so I will behave better. In any case, it's my great uh, pleasure to introduce the, the moderator for tonight's panel. It's an old, uh, old friend, uh, or someone that I know for a long time. He's not that old. Uh, but Hector Cordero uh, is a professor at Baruch College. He and I came across when he was a, a sociology student, graduate student, way back. And then through Centro, I, you know, I, I, uh, he actually was a uh, researcher when I did my postdoc back in 1987. He doesn't remember that, but I do. Uh, he also uh, edited one monograph that I published with Central at the time. So I know Hector for a long time, and it's my privilege. He has Excel. At some point, he was our benefactor. He, well, he was in the Ford Foundation. He supported the field. He actually transformed the field of solidarity with the immigrant community that is undocumented. Uh, through his leadership, Ford Foundation funded a lot of of the organizations support, uh, strengthened the, the National Day Labor uh, Organization. And those of us who were in the field at the time of uh, immigrant labor, specifically undocumented immigrant labor, owe a lot of, uh, 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 to Hector for his support to the field and the way he actually impacted the field. I can go on for a little bit more, but you don't want me to do that. And probably Hector is already you know, embarrassed by what I'm saying. Beyond embarrassed. Beyond embarrassed, okay. 
But we, it's my pleasure, Hector, to uh, pass the baton to you, and thank you all for being here tonight. Wow. Thanks, Edwin. Much appreciated for uh, that very soulful introduction. Um, I truly appreciate it. And for those of you that want to know more about that work with uh, low-wage immigrant workers, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce has released three reports. Uh, one, I think, is entitled The Work of Evil Foundation Supporting uh, 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 Illegals Working in the U.S. or some such. Uh, we raised a lot of hell from, from, from folks that don't want to do good by those populations. But in any event, we're here to celebrate the publication of really an amazing book and one who's uh, whose time has come and who's been a long time in coming, you know, for those of us that have been engaged in doing research on the Puerto Rico population, it's almost like we have to have two libraries, our Puerto Rico library and our U Puerto Ricans in the U.S. library. And rarely, maybe sometimes in the work of Frank and others at the Centro, did those two libraries intersect until now, uh, thankfully in the work of this really beautiful book that uh, Marie, uh, uh, Javidan, and Alberto have put together and have uh, been so kind to come and share with us. Let me just introduce them, allow them to make a presentation of the, of the, of the content of, of the terrific research that they've done. I'll come back and maybe open up with a couple of questions and then commentary on the book. And then this is like a family conversation on a topic that is near and dear to all of us and that we really need to spend some time discussing. Uh, the book is Population, Migration, and Socioeconomic Outcomes Among Island and Mainland Puerto Ricans. La Crisis Boricua has so been baptized by now uh, by Marie Timora, Alberto Adavila, and Javidan Rodriguez, uh, an old and, and dear friend and colleague. And I, around the same time, I met Edwin as a, as a uh, trying to figure my way, graduate student. Javidan is also a graduate student at the University of Wisconsin Madison, uh, the great sociology program in the country. Uh, so, Vidan Havidan has been trained by the best and has gone on to have a really terrific career. He served as a founding provost and executive vice president for academic affairs at the University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley. I did a program uh, when I was in graduate school with some folks from Texas who talked about the valley as the valley, and it's that valley mm -hmm. that, that, that Havidan uh, has been kind enough to, uh, to work in. He was deputy provost at the University of Delaware. And he was a faculty member for about a decade or so, including uh, being associate dean and other uh, administrative positions at the University of Puerto Rico and Maya West. And now, the state of New York and the citizens of the state of New York and the taxpayers of the state of New York are lucky to have him as the president of the University at Albany, affectionately known to some old schoolers as SUNY Albany. Uh, <laughs> but maybe he'll like fight me off because now there's a new branding. The University at Albany is lucky to have uh, Havidan and we're lucky to have Havidan here to talk about his book and Havidan has been joined by Professor Marimora, who's not only a professor, who's also Associate Vice Provost for Faculty Diversity at the University of Texas at Rio Grande Valley. Uh, Marie's a very active uh, economist, both in the field and on social media. Uh, 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 agitating and bringing people together. Mm -hmm. He's a professor of economics and, and, and currently director of the American Economic Association's NSF-funded economics mentoring program. And when I tell you agitating, if you're a, 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 a Latino economist, that and of itself is an amazing accomplishment. And in a field that by now is beginning to have some reflections about how it, how it mentors and how it brings up young scholars. And I think uh, Marie has been in a leadership position in, in terms of making that profession really reach out to a, to a broader uh, research constituency. Her research interests are labor economics, particularly in the areas of Hispanic Latino labor market and other socioeconomic outcomes, including self-employment and migration. And clearly the sections in the book that talk about small business enterprise and entrepreneurship are inspired by some of the work that Marie's done before. It's really a terrific book. Let me uh, get out of the way and let Javidan and Marie uh, present some, some, some of their findings and some of their research, and then we'll come back and hopefully have a good discussion. Thank you. I'm really excited to be here today. I'm very excited that one of my co-authors, Javier Rodriguez, you just heard his wonderful introduction. Um, I also want to mention that not only he is he the new president at University at Albany, he is not only the first Puerto Rican president at that university, he is the first Latino president of, of any of the four-year SUNY institutions. So I think that deserves a major round of applause. 
Um, our other co-author, Alberto Davila, could not be here today. Uh, he's also with me at UTRGV, University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley, although he's soon as to be leaving as well. He's the next dean of the Harrison uh, College of Business. Uh, but again, thank you very much. We thank uh, Edwin and the Cent and Central for such a wonderful, warm uh, reception. We also want to thank Lily Santiago for all of her help with all the, the basic logistics. So um, thank you very much, Lily. Uh, we do have a long title for the book, and again, Hector went ahead and read that. Um, one of the things that uh, we were uh, very happy about with respect to our book, uh, it appeared in, it came into print in November 2017. Uh, we weren't sure if it was going to be a 2017 or 2018 publication. We were hoping for 2017 because of the 100 year anniversary of the Joan Shafford Act. Um, and many people here know, and also those watching, this was the act that granted Puerto Ricans U.S. citizenship, US citizenship by birthright. Um, so here we have a, a whole century of U.S. citizens, and yet at the time, and a lot of our book, our book was written before Hurricane Maria struck, uh, we were looking at the 100 year anniversary when the island was facing grave economic challenges and was already undergoing a humanitarian crisis before Maria struck. So we hear about the humanitarian crisis now, but it was already underway, and all that Maria has done is escalated. Um, one of the things that, um, as Hector mentioned, we, we do call La Crisis Bariqua. Uh, we kept talking when we were working on our book about the crisis, the economic crisis. But it was so deep and so compelling and lasted so long, again, starting in 2006, uh, that we just felt that it needed its own uh, standalone name. Uh, some of our colleagues also refer to it as econ uh, Puerto Rico's economic depression, uh, and it certainly is a depression. Uh, for example, Jose Carabayo Cueto, who's at University of Puerto Rico at Calle. Um, but it's worth emphasizing that it wasn't Maria that has caused a lot of the devastation. Uh, certainly has only escalated it, but the economic issues were already well underway. Uh, in addition, uh, we talk in our book a lot about 2006 as being the year of the perfect storm where a lot of events came together. Um, but it's worth mentioning that 2006 was not so magical. It's not like everything just imploded. Uh, there were a lot of issues that were in the makings essentially for decades. Uh, so it's not that 2006 just came along and things went downhill from there. There were a lot of uh, long-term uh, chronic economic problems. Uh, so again, both the economic crisis as well as uh, Hurricane Maria have, uh, have escalated these issues. Uh, so that means that, again, 100 years after US, uh, U.S. citizenship by birthright, uh, the island is facing grave and unprecedented economic, social, uh, humanitarian, and dem uh, demographic challenges. At the same time, there are some opportunities, so we do want to talk a little bit about the opportunities today. When I give presentations like this, I think it's always important to say, well, why should the U.S. at large care? Um, I think with this audience, we know why the U.S. at large should care. Um, and essentially, we want to go beyond caring just for basic humanity. Um, again, I have to keep emphasizing Puerto Ricans are U.S. citizens by birthright. Um, also, we're not talking about a small population. The island of Puerto Rico currently has 3.3 million residents. Uh, that is a large population. In fact, there are 21 states, as well as Washington, D.C., whose populations are less than 3.3 million. Uh, so that is something that I think gets lost in the, the shuffle or the discussion that, oh, it's a small population. It's actually not. Um, I think of some of the issues were happening today uh, in states like Arkansas, Nevada, Vermont, Rhode Island. Um, I think we'd hear much more about it in the news in terms of what has been happening uh, in Puerto Rico. In addition, uh, there are 5.3 million individuals who identify as being Puerto Rican living on the mainland. Um, and as Hector said, our book, we focus, uh, we talk a lot about uh, islands as well as mainland Puerto Ricans. So we're talking about a population of nine, almost nine million people, uh, which is certainly not trivial. In terms of the Hispanic population, uh, Puerto Ricans represent the, the second largest Hispanic group, uh, but certainly in certain states like New York, uh, Puerto Ricans represent the largest Hispanic group. And even in Florida, they represent the second largest group, but if you do Florida minus Miami, uh, then Puerto Ricans are also the largest Hispanic group, a Latino group in that state. Um, as part of uh, what his, one of the trends, one of the outcomes of uh, La Crisis has been the out-migration, and we'll share some of the, our estimates of net out-migration with you shortly, uh, but this means that we are seeing the Puerto Rican presence growing and developing in many areas on the U.S. mainland. Um, certainly we have the traditional receiving areas like New York, uh, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, uh, but Florida has become a major receiving area. Um, we refer to Florida as essentially an, an old, new uh, destination area. Uh, it emerged more of a destination area in the 1970s and 80s. Um, but in terms of the migrants from the island, Florida has received a third of those migrants since 2006. 
Um, and it turns out Texas uh, is one of the largest receiving areas since 2006. In fact, Texas is currently the fourth largest receiving state uh, since 2006. Um, in our book, we talk about it as being the fifth largest, uh, but the last couple of years as new data have come in, it's actually moved to, uh, to number four. Um, the second one is uh, Pennsylvania, the third one is New York. Uh, then we have Massachusetts and Texas, which have flipped. So again, it's uh, important to note that the longer it takes for this crisis uh, to address, um, the, the longer the issues are going to be in terms of the net out migration, and again, we'll share some of those numbers with you, uh, the demographic shif shift, which we also will also talk about, economic decline, and again, of course, uh, basic human suffering. So what Hurricane Maria did was essentially unleash a lot of the issues that were already in play. Um, and again, I want to emphasize, we already had the humanitarian crisis unfolding before the hurricane struck. Now, when Maria struck, uh, the, wind, uh, the wind speeds were 155 miles per hour. Um, I remember watching the news and they kept saying, you know, Maria was a Category 5 and oh, thank goodness, it, it slowed down to a Category 4. And technically, yes, we're happy that it slowed down, but 155 mile per hour is simply two miles shy of being Category 5. So whether it's four or five, it's, it's basically a five. Um, and also you need to consider to put 155 mile per hour wind speed into perspective. This is equivalent to an EF3 tornado. So essentially a tornado went through the island of Puerto Rico and it's not a weak EF3, uh, it's uh, on the higher end. Uh, so certainly we saw a lot of catastrophic devastation and suffering across the island, a lot of which continues today. In the immediate aftermath, we see, uh, we again had the 3.3 million island residents who were left island-wide without electricity, which I guess with the news yesterday about another blackout um, uh, back into the uh, people being left without electricity, um, water, running water was wiped out, basic telecommunications. So basically a lot of our amenities that we take for granted were gone. And yet here we are seven months later and we still have literally tens of thousands of Americans who are suffering and have not had their power restored. Um, I get annoyed if my electricity goes out for three hours, um, so I can't imagine for seven months. I was talking with a colleague recently who said, well, you know, people say, well, there are power generators. Yes, but the power generators are designed to last just a couple of days. They're not designed to last months. And, and here we're talking about seven months. It's more than half a year later. Okay, so consider uh, what happened pre-Maria. Um, our book, actually, we got the galley proofs two days after the hurricane struck. So a lot of our book was written before the hurricane. We begged the editors, please let us have an addendum. Normally, they don't want you to make changes uh, other than uh, correcting typos, and we do have an addendum. They told us we could have three paragraphs. <laughs> They're long paragraphs, but we do have that in there. Uh, they are long. <laughs> um, in our book, we talk a lot about 2006 as being the year of the perfect storm, which, again, ironic after, after the, what happened with Maria. Um, I'm going to just go through some of these points quickly and we'll, in a little bit, we'll talk about these in a little bit more detail. Um, but 2006 essentially kicked off a crippling shutdown of high-tech industries. Uh, this was spurred by something called IRS Code Section 936, and I'll talk a bit more about that shortly. Uh, there was a significant loss since 2006 of public and private sector jobs. Uh, we have seen massive net out-migration from the island since 2006. In fact, in terms of absolute numbers, what has happened since 2006, again, this is before Maria, uh, this is the largest net out migration from the island. Now relative to the size of the island's population, it's the second largest. Those would be uh, going back to the 1950s that we've seen relative to the population size, these migration numbers, again before Maria. So it's, it's likely the both on an absolute and relative sense of the out migration is the highest we've seen. As a result, you have, you know, a lot of the migrants are younger. Uh, so this is leaving behind a shrinking and rapidly aging population. Uh, it's a population that also has low fertility rates and, and fortunately a life, a long lifespan. Uh, but that has brought in itself a new, new set of challenges in terms of this shrinking population that's also aging. Um, we uh, discussed in our book, we looked a little bit at some of the skill levels of the migrants coming in. We did not find a disproportionate share of the high-skilled uh, migrants moving, although it is worth noting that there has been a significant loss of doctors and physicians from the island to the mainland. And so again, that is compounding some of the humanitarian crisis and is causing an overstretched healthcare system to be even more overstretched. Uh, we've seen, uh, again, since 2006, deteriorating infrastructures uh, for healthcare is one of them, uh, education and also public utilities, which again with yesterday's blackout is, not a remind is another reminder. Um, I think it was September 2016, there was also another island-wide blackout, so the, electri uh, the electrical infrastructure has been in need of repair for quite some time. With the loss of industry, there's also been a lo significant loss of bank deposits, which means there's a loss of capital uh, for people who need it at a time the most. 
Um, as some of you might know, uh, the island, again, before Maria, was already $74 billion in debt. Plus, what doesn't get reported as much, there was another $49 billion in unfunded pension obligations. So we're talking essentially about $123 billion uh, in public debt. Um, as a result, there were some defaults on payments to bondholders. Hence uh, came the PERMESA legislation, which has been controversial in certain circles. Uh, this has reinvigorated some of the debates about Puerto Rico's status, uh, essentially a de facto uh, colonial status. The island was able to file for federal banks of bankruptcy protection in May 2017. Uh, that, this was through PERMESA. Uh, being a territory, they could not, the island could not actually go through the normal uh, procedure to have bankruptcy. Uh, I'll talk just a brief a bit more uh, later in the presentation about PERMESA. The island is also facing a relatively high cost of living, uh, including an 11.5% sales tax. Uh, this sales tax is higher than any state has. Uh, in addition, there's a relatively high cost of transported goods. There was an economics consulting firm back in December 2016, again, so this is all pre-Maria, uh, that predicted that the island's economy would not be restored to its 2006 level uh, until the year 2034. And I think that was their mid-road uh, estimate. They had a scenario, optimistic scenario that I think it was like 2028 would be the year, and then their pessimistic, pessimistic scenario was something like 2042. Would we see the island's economy return to its 2006 level? Again, this is back in December 2016. So this was Puerto Rico's reality when Hurricane Maria struck. All right, so in terms of some of our out-migration numbers, um, these are as recent as we, could, uh, as we have them. Uh, it says 2017, but these actually are up to July 1st. Uh, this is, these are those, uh, based on some of the Census Bureau estimates. So these don't take into account the out-migration that we've seen since the hurricane. I know that Edwin's group here at Centro uh, have been publishing some of the estimates of out-migration due to Hurricane Maria, but these, these do not account for Maria. Um, so back in 2006, the population on the island was about 3.9 million, um, and the, by 2017 it had fallen to 3.3 million people. So we're talking about a loss of about 600,000 people in terms of absolute uh, population size. When we count the almost 130,000 people, so that would be the natural increase, taking into account the difference between live births and deaths, we sh should have an extra 130,000 people. So those are also missing. Combined, we're talking about a loss uh, in terms of about 720,000 people, uh, which is significant. That represents over 18% of the island's 2006 population. So almost one out of every five island residents left due to out-migration. Um, the vast majority, vast, vast majority went to the U.S. mainland, as you can imagine. Uh, but we also have some people who are missing uh, from our estimates. And so the assumption here is that they've gone to other countries. And that's a story that um, hasn't been told as much. Um, I was at a panel discussion uh, back at the beginning of March uh, at a conference about Puerto Rico. And one of the other panelists was in the banking industry. And he said he had, had colleagues who left Puerto Rico to go to places like Argentina, Mexico, and Spain. Uh, from, and so it's like, okay, there's my anecdotal evidence about where people are going. And so that's another uh, topic that we hope to explore. Um, in terms of the 1950s with the Great Migration, uh, the size of the population left was a little bit more than one out of five. So 18% is still smaller, but substantial. And again, with Hurricane Maria, it's likely that we've gone beyond that. Looking at some of these out-migration numbers, so on an annual basis, these are individuals who are identifying themselves as uh, being Puerto Rico. These are people who lived on the island the year before the survey. Uh, and they are currently living on the mainland. So looking at 2006 to 2016, these are the most recent data that we have. We updated a little bit for the presentation from what we have in the book. Uh, but the top line there you have in red, these are the out-migrants from the island to the mainland, and then the green line you have below is from the mainland to the island. Um, their island has experienced massive net out-migration, but there has been some inflow uh, from the mainland. Uh, but we can see that uh, for the beginning part of this period, the difference between the two is not so great. Uh, we have to remember on the mainland between 2007 and 2009, the mainland was experiencing what we now refer to as the Great Recession. So there were not as many job opportunities uh, happening at that time. So it makes sense that there would not be as much outflow. Uh, but certainly since the US labor market has recovered, we've seen much more out-migration. And then the immigration is somewhat stabilized. So we have had this growing gap. I was looking at 2016, it looked like that had been stabilizing a little bit. But again, this is before Maria. Okay, so next graph. I realized when I was looking at this, these look like watermelon slices, so nothing uh, there. I just I like the colors. Um, what you have there with the big graph, uh, the big line there at the end, this is the difference. Basically, it's adding together the annual 
out migration and immigration and looking at what happened with Puerto Rico. So the big red, these would be the out migrants over this period, 2006 to 2016, and then the green part on the top would be the inflow. Um, the other lines you might see, you might not be able to read the names, but these are the largest receiving states. So the first one that has the large green areas is Florida. And then you, there's been a little bit of outflow from Florida to the island. What we're not showing here is that Florida's also received a lot of in-migration from other states. So it could be that as Puerto Ricans are moving and migrating to the mainland, they're also, they might, for example, stop in New York or New Jersey. If they're not finding job opportunities, they may be going down to Florida. So Florida represents the largest receiving area from the island and the mainland, but also from other states. Uh, the next one we have Pennsylvania, then New York, Texas, Massachusetts, New Jersey, and Connecticut. When you look at the net migration, again, Texas has actually moved to number two uh, if we look at the difference between inflow and outflow. Okay, so in terms of some of the outcomes of the settlement patterns, um, this is a, one of the first graphs that we put together at the top part. Uh, we were looking at individuals uh, between Puerto Rico and also the U.S. mainland who identified themselves as Puerto Ricans. So we have our Puerto Rican population. And the top line is what percentage of this population lived on the island. And we can see that since 2006, there's been a sharp downturn. Uh, this is going down, down to 2016. So back in 2006, about half of Puerto Ricans lived on the island of Puerto Rico. Um, by 2016, this was a little bit more than a third. And I remember being at a presentation that Edwin Melendez gave a couple of years ago, and he was saying, this was again before Maria, uh, that the projection was by 2020, we would probably have two-thirds of all Puerto Ricans who were living on the mainland and about one-third on the island. Um, the numbers were well on their way, but again, with Maria, it, it may have already happened. The two bottom lines, uh, we have the percentage of the Puerto Rican population living in New York. So the orange one is New York. And you'll notice it's relatively flat. There's actually been a little bit of a decrease in terms of Puerto Rican, the, the share of the Puerto Rican population that lives in New York. And then the green line that is just below that is Florida. And so even since 2006, there's been a big uptake uh, in terms of the Puerto Rican presence in Florida, and also you can say the, the Floridian Puerto Ricans uh, among the Puerto Rican population. Um, by 2016, we actually are seeing as many Puerto Ricans who are living in New York as we have in Florida. Uh, so right now, and again, this is before the hurricane, about 1.1 million uh, Puerto Ricans were living in both areas. We also, as a result of the out-migration, as I mentioned, there is a shrinking and rapidly aging population that's left behind. Um, to get a, a good glimpse at that, uh, it's useful to look at population pyramids. And so we have some, uh, just to share with you, uh, population pyramids, this is the way that we can look at our age distribution. This is a pyramid for, of Puerto Rico's population in 1950. And what you have going up from the bottom, and I, I'm going to have to separate from the podium, you have the younger population, so we have ages eight, uh, 0 to 4, then we have 5 to 9, and so forth. So what this is showing by having the pyramidal shape is that it a relatively, was a relatively young population. This is back in 1950. Um, by, by, the, by the year 2000, uh, you notice it becomes more of a beehive shape. Uh, this is as the population is aging. So we're picking up more of the representation of, they're still young, but the older, but we are seeing the population aging. Um, and the difference between this is the women and then this, this is the men. So it also lets you see uh, gender distributions. Okay, and this is the year 2015, so again, continuing this beehive shape. What this is illustrating is that the population has been aging over a pretty quick, a pretty short period of time. Uh, these are based on actual estimates uh, in terms of projections. Uh, this is a projection for the year 2025. Again, this is before Maria, and you notice that the aging of the population continues. Um, a projection for the year 2050 uh, is that the population is, is considered to be relatively old. In fact, as it is now, the population is considered to be an old population uh, for the island. We also discuss a lot about the weak labor market conditions in Puerto Rico. Uh, Puerto Rico has had a weak labor market, and again, 2006 essentially made things worse, again, before, uh, before the hurricane. Um, but in terms of what labor market conditions have looked like, the Bureau of Labor Statistics started reporting on state and local area estimates on a monthly basis, I believe back in 1976. Uh, since 1976, Puerto Rico has only had six months where the, pop, where the unemployment rate has fallen below 10%. Uh, so again, 2006 wasn't the year that everything just uh, came together. It, it was basically building on uh, issues that were, uh, that were brewing for quite some time. Uh, what we have here is we, we are looking at unemployment rates. So the top graph or the top panel 
we're looking at island-born Puerto Ricans. And so our book, we talk about island-born and mainland-born Puerto Ricans just for a little bit more insight. Um, what these are showing us is the unemployment rates both on the island and the mainland. And so again, I'll step away from the mic, try to speak a little bit louder. Uh, this line here with the diamonds represents the actual unemployment rates on the island of people who are island-born, uh, starting off at, at about 16, 17%. And there has been an increase, but it has been relatively mild compared to other areas. Uh, part of the reason why we think that the unemployment rate has not gone up more has been due to outmigration and also declining labor force participation. Labor force participation rates on the island are some of the lowest in the world. Uh, they were low also in 2006, but they've only since declined. Uh, when you add in, so we have some estimates of when you add in those missing people from the labor force, like basically to say what happened if the labor force had stayed the same uh, since 2006, uh, the unemployment rate would be much higher. And how much higher, that is what that, that top graph is. So these are our projected or estimated unemployment rates that would have prevailed if we did not see that loss in labor force partici participation. Uh, and that would be equivalent to about 25% uh, unemployment rate on the island. Um, the actual unemployment rate is still close to 20%, uh, or was in this case, it, it, this was up to 2014. And then we also see that the island-born Puerto Ricans on the mainland, which is the second part of this graph, have very high unemployment rates on the mainland as well. Not quite as high as on the island, but also they are quite high on the mainland, so that even by 2014, island-born Puerto Ricans on the mainland had unemployment rates about 10%, which is quite high. Uh, the bottom panel does the same thing by looking at mainland-born mainland Puerto Ricans. And again, on the island, people who are born on the mainland but working on the island also had very high unemployment rates and are projected, again, if you add in that loss of labor force participation, would have been uh, close to 30% uh, back in 2014. So these are dire numbers. We talk much, uh, I love numbers, I should say. So we do have a lot more numbers in terms of our labor market outcomes in our book. Uh, we talk a lot about the poverty issues, and so there have been high and sustained poverty rates uh, on the island as well as mainland. Uh, so these top, the two top lines are looking at island residents. So the very top one is island-born island residents, and the second one is mainland-born mainland residents. And we can see that the, uh, sorry, the poverty rates are quite high. Um, island-born island residents, even up to 2014, were over 45%, so almost half of island-born residents were impoverished. Um, I know that Hector has done some research in terms of childhood poverty, and I think some of your estimates are, what, 60%? 58 percent. So yeah, just about 60 percent. And uh, so that's, remember, this is all before Maria. So um, we have, in our book, we talk a lot about the working age population. So this, uh, we don't f uh, focus on children, but I know that Hector has, has discussed uh, childhood poverty. Um, then the two bottom lines here, uh, these are mainland residents. So the, I'm sorry, the poverty rates are considerably lower on the mainland, but they're still quite high. We're talking about among uh, island-born mainland residents, we are looking at poverty rates close to 30% on the mainland. Um, the bottom panel is looking also at Mexican immigrants, Mexican-Americans, uh, and not hispanic whites, just for uh, com uh, com comparative purposes. All right, so some of the other issues, as I mentioned, uh, with respect to why, you know, what, what happened in 2006, why is that <coughs> the starting point for a lot of our discussion? Um, well, there was the expiration of the Section 39, Section 936 of the IRS code. And if you're not familiar with this code, back in 1976, this was the code that gave U.S. corporations tax breaks by producing in Puerto Rico. Um, but it was announced in, in t uh, 1996 that these tax breaks would be expired. So they were slowly phased out over a 10-year a, a period. Um, they officially expired on December 1st, 2005. I'm sorry, December 31st, the end of the year. Um, as a result, it's not a surprise that businesses, even in anticipation of the complete phase-out, um, started leaving the island, others scaled back. And so our estimates between 2006 and 2014, uh, there were about 37,000 manufacturing jobs that were lost uh, during that period. And this was on top of previous estimates that that rollout period, the 10-year period leading up to 2006, uh, there were about 30,000 other manufacturing jobs lost. Uh, we've looked at other sources of data and other, uh, what other uh, researchers have found, and our estimates are pretty much in that ballpark. If we're talking about a loss of business and industry and jobs, that means we are also observing a loss of bank deposits and capital. And again, this is a time when people uh, probably need access to credit most. This was also a time period that we saw the imposition of sales taxes. So 2006, the first sales tax uh, was, or was uh, put into place. Um, the, we talk a lot about in our book some of the, 
the government issues that were happening in 2006. So the government had a shutdown and uh, they were having issues dealing with the budget. So one of the budgetary uh, in, uh, solutions was to have the sales tax. Uh, it was put into place at 7 percent, but was raised in 2015 to 11 and percent, which again is higher than any other state. As a result of some of the government's uh, budgetary issues, there's also significant loss of public sector jobs. Uh, so we estimate that, again, between 2006 and 2014, uh, there was about 70,000 jobs lost, both at we have the, like the state level, so basically island-wide level and then at the local level. And then we are still seeing the continuation of the closure of schools, uh, which in itself adds to another very complicated layer of, of issues. Uh, so if we're losing schools, we're not just losing the jobs, but we're losing the the convenience and the educational opportunities for children on the island. Um, other issues, again, this is all pre-Maria. Electricity was uh, one of the big issues. Um, despite, you might say, despite the service offered, it is relatively expensive. Um, and during the period 2006 onward, uh, there were periods in there where oil prices spiked. Uh, in fact, they're on their way up again. Puerto Rico relies very heavily on oil to produce electricity. And Puerto Rico does not, it's not a, an oil producing areas, so that means they have to transport oil, and there's a cost uh, involved with that. It could be costly uh, transportation. There was a collapse in housing prices. Um, you know, on the mainland, we had a collapse in housing prices as well uh, during the Great Recession. However, our housing prices have recovered. Uh, they have not recovered on the island. In addition, with the out-migration, some people are just leaving their homes, uh, which means then we have this growing supply, a, sur a surplus of homes which has very bleak implications for the construction industry um, and very bleak implications for the accumulation of wealth um, if we consider the, the, how our equity is built into our, our, the homes that we own. Um, I suppose with Maria, the construction industry, that, that might be turning around. Healthcare industry, again, the island is medically underserved and the out-migration of doctors and physicians has not helped that. Uh, there are some, particularly uh, some specialties where you have maybe one or, or just a small handful of physicians that are essentially covering the entire, uh, to the entire island. And again, we're talking about a rapidly aging population. You saw those population pyramids. That means there's going to be even more of a demand for healthcare services, uh, but the supply of those services is, is uh, dwindling. We also talk a lot in our book about some of the differences uh, of the characteristics of Puerto Ricans as they're moving from the island to mainland. Uh, so there's not essentially a one-size-fits-all. What is the profile of the migrant moving from, from Puerto Rico to different states? Um, it, the characteristics differ considerably depending on where they're moving. Uh, the middle line there that has that big section of white, uh, this is, by the way, the labor force, uh, labor force breakdown. This is Texas. Uh, the wet part is looking at, this is a percentage of Puerto Ricans who move from the island into Texas who are employed. Uh, that is higher than what we're seeing in any of the other states, um, even higher than what we're seeing in, in Port, uh, Florida, which is here. And then we put the island in Puerto Rico just for, compar uh, for comparison purposes. Um, this other section, these are people who are unemployed technically, so these are people who are looking for work. And then the people who are outside of the labor force is in the gray section. And again, we can see Texas, there's a very small percentage of people who are moving from the island into Texas. And we have a, an additional survey from our colleagues at the Puerto Rico Institute of Statistics. We presented some of our findings a few years ago there, and they have a very neat data set that we were able to access from Mario Morazzi. Um, it's the traveler survey data, uh, and it has information uh, from when people are at airports uh, and to find out, you know, why are they traveling? And one of the questions, that, like, if people are moving, then it's like, well, why are you moving? Uh, and so, People moving to Texas are, we were very happy that it's aligning with what we're finding. Uh, people moving to Texas are more likely to report that they're moving because of work, okay, or for employment purposes. Whereas people moving to places like Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, and even New York are more likely to report family related purposes. Um, Connecticut, by the way, we don't have shown here, but Connecticut looks an awful lot like Massachusetts, which is probably not a surprise because we're really talking about the, uh, the communities that are, that are overlapping. We uh, look a little bit, uh, we take a look at some of the earnings differentials. Uh, so I have here just a couple of sample things that we end up doing. Uh, this is looking at earnings differentials between Puerto Ricans and non-Hispanic whites uh, overall on the mainland and also looking at uh, some specific states um, and as well as in Puerto Rico. So this 71%, uh, this represents uh, Puerto Ricans in Puerto Rico 
earned about 71% less than non-Hispanic whites. This is not accounting for differences in education or age, et cetera. Uh, so it's a substantial earnings difference, uh, but it is smaller in magnitude than looking at the new migrants, those who just moved from the island to the mainland who earned about 95% less than non-Hispanic whites. Uh, we have Florida, Texas, and New York, uh, just for, uh, uh, again, for some, uh, some, I guess, comparative purposes. Uh, in our book, we talk about other states as well. Uh, but those who are moving to Texas fare relatively well. We're still talking about a 76% earnings differences with non-Hispanic whites. Now, those differences fall dramatically when we account for differences in education, in age, uh, English proficiency, occupation, et cetera. Um, so the earnings gap between non-Hispanic whites and Puerto Rico in Puerto Rico, uh, in Puerto Rico falls from 71.6% to 48.3%. Uh, which is still substantial. Okay, so again, it's not that there's differences in education that are driving the story. Uh, it's something that's unexplained um, for just moving to Texas, but they seem to not be paid. They seem to not be paid on the basis of what their skills are worth. Um, and then New York, which had a very high difference with non-Hispanic whites among the new migrants, of almost 91 percent. A lot of that can be explained through differences in other characteristics. It falls to a seven, about seven percent earnings difference. Um, which is still substantial, but again, 7% is certainly a lot smaller than we're talking about 15, uh, 15%, 30%. Uh, here's uh, something similar with respect to poverty rate differentials. Uh, so island-born Puerto Ricans who have just moved to the mainland, so these are people, they lived on the island last year, they have migrated to the mainland. Um, in terms of what their poverty rates look like, uh, Texas had a poverty rate about 14.1%, uh, which is relatively low compared to the other states. Um, but Pennsylvania, New York, Massachusetts, we're talking about almost two-thirds of migrants who just settled uh, from the island were living in poverty during this time period. And this is aggregated uh, between 2006 to 2014. A lot of the difference can be explained through, again, differences in education, differences in age, whether people are working. Um, but the, the differences are still significant, they're still sub substantial. So even in Texas, which had a poverty rate of about 14.1%, relative to non-Hispanic whites who are similar, again, same education levels, et cetera, um, there's still an unexplained poverty rate gap of about 4.5 percentage points, which is substantial. It looks small because it's a lot smaller than we're talking about Pennsylvania that has an unexplained poverty rate differential of 35 percentage points. Um, so again, there are challenges that this population has as they move to the mainland. In terms of some of the potential impediments uh, to address the crisis, um, again, this crisis has started in 2006, but the economic issues had been in place for many years before, had been in place essentially for decades. Um, there are effects uh, when we consider what's happening, not only on the island, but also we have these major implications for mainland communities. We have the $123 billion of debt that I mentioned before, uh, meaning that the island does not have the capital uh, to rebuild the island's economy or the deteriorating infrastructures all before Maria. Um, the legislation that PROMESA put into place, this has reinvigorated the debates about what Puerto Rico's status is. Um, people are calling it a pseudo colony, it's a de facto co uh, colony, uh, and these are issues and dialogues uh, that will hopefully continue. With respect to the PROMESA Oversight Board, uh, there are uh, some, there have been some individuals who are extremely upset about what the board is supposed to, what, what the, the responsibilities of the board are. Um, the board is supposed to help Puerto Rico restructure its debt, uh, but the board has no obligation or commitment to seeing the long-term economic success of the island. So again, it, it's about resolving the debt, but not really about resolving the, ma the major economic issues, uh, the job issues um, in terms of the chronic problems that island has had. And so this is, again, something that hopefully we'll have more of a dialogue about. It seems like there was dialogue when PROMESA was first announced, but it tends to get lost in the shuffle. Um, there's also some concerns about the restructuring of the island's income taxes as well as minimum wages. Um, there has been a provision floating around for the last couple of years that perhaps Puerto Rico should pay workers who are under the age of 26 $4.25. And so and, and that has its own kind of, so if we're concerned about out-migration, then what is likely to happen is it's going to exacerbate out-migration for the younger, particularly the younger workers to move to the mainland. Um, I don't know what the status of that is, but it, it, uh, it is one of the things, uh, one of the topics that's floating around. Um, we are expecting that the weak labor market will continue, a high unemployment, and again, which would be even higher if it was not for that low labor force participation rate. And essentially, there's been out, uh, um, an, an exporting of some of the unemployment. 
Uh, the demographic shift also represents one of the major impediments to the island's recovery. Again, this rapidly aging population that is compounded by the out-migration uh, and low fertility rates on the island. The high cost of living, uh, the, including those that are induced uh, through some of the transportation costs and high sales taxes. Uh, there are some new taxes that have been announced, and this is, it, it, to me, it adds insult to injury in the sense that once the Section 936 was phased out, uh, that caused a lot of companies to leave the island. Uh, that was for the tax breaks. Uh, but now there's a new provision that intellectual property on goods produced in Puerto Rico will now be taxed. So it's in addition to not having a tax credit, there's an additional tax uh, with respect to this property, which is likely to hit the pharmaceutical and, and manufacturing industry. Um, it's going to redu likely reduce the competitiveness. The interesting thing about this provision is that it is a tax on foreign produced goods. So I put foreign there in quotes. For the purpose of this tax, Puerto Rico is considered to be a foreign entity. Um, at the same time, the resiliency of the Puerto Rican population should not be uh, underestimated. And this is something that is going to be presenting opportunities, has presented opportunities. Uh, so one of the opportunities is that we are looking at the Puerto Rican population rapidly growing in certain areas, including new areas where there were few Puerto Ricans residing before. That means that there's a greater potential for impact, a greater potential for uh, getting involved with, with policy-related work. Um, we were anxiously awaiting the results of the 2016 uh, presidential election as we were working with finalizing uh, some of our, our book the, the previous year. Uh, we didn't see the impact that we were expecting, but this as the migrants continue to come to the mainland, particularly in states like Florida, the swing state, uh, and Pennsylvania, that we could see some, uh, some changes taking place as time goes on. Another uh, opportunity is that on the mainland, we've seen a rapid, a rapid growth in the number of Puerto Rican-owned businesses. Uh, between 2007 and 2012, I know the numbers are a little outdated, but these were the most recent numbers we could have. Uh, this is out of the survey of business owners from the U.S. Census Bureau. There was a 65% increase in the number of businesses owned by Puerto Ricans on the mainland. Um, that was higher than other Hispanic groups, so Mexican Americans were 58% higher than the, the growth rate for Cubans, and certainly a lot higher than the growth rate of the number of businesses owned by non-Hispanic whites. I don't have it here as a bullet point, but a lot of these the business growth was driven by women, Puerto Rican women, uh, who were opening businesses. Uh, the uh, Puerto Rican population is highly educated and highly bilingual. Uh, that represents opportunities both on the mainland and on the island. If we consider the island has a lot of strategic amenities that could be tapped into, uh, it's just its geographic location, uh, its natural beauty, it's a, a prime place for, uh, for tourism. As the rebuilding continues, uh, this can lead to greater efficiencies. Uh, for example, I'm, we talk about the deteriorated uh, electrical infrastructure. Well, with, with rebuilding the whole infrastructure, this is one of the opportunities that can, uh, can take place, perhaps with greater efficiency, which can bring down the price of electricity on the island. Uh, perhaps there could be some strategic target opportunities. Um, when I was at the summit uh, here uh, at Centro back in the fall, I think it was in October, um, there was some discussion about perhaps Puerto Rico could be a, a great location for medical tourism. Uh, this would be a way to keep uh, the doctors on the island and also bring more business to the region. In terms of some of the impl implications for mainland communities, again, with Maria, we're continuing to see massive additional net uh, migration from the island. Again, this is on top of what we've been seeing since 2006. It was already at record numbers and is likely to have uh, exceeded even the 1950s uh, relative numbers. In, when we talk about some of the characteristics of the migrants moving to particular states, again, it's not a one-size-fits-all approach. And so one of the things to consider if social workers and local government officials are trying to help and facilitate the transition of migrants from the island into their new communities, um, they really should be aware of what the characteristics and what the needs uh, of these migrants are. Uh, so because the characteristics differ, then policymakers and social workers, et cetera, should consider what the needs, uh, for example, um, employment might be a bigger issue and education in some of the traditional settlement areas, uh, then looking at what the skill levels are of the, and the, the match of skills to jobs uh, in states like Texas. Impoverishment in the, in the traditional areas does continue, uh, and this also raises questions about interge intergenerational progress. Uh, we have uh, Puerto Rican communities that are third, fourth, fifth generation, and yet we still see high sustained poverty rates, uh, low employment rates, et cetera. Uh, and so this does raise a question, especially as we have this growing population uh, moving from the island, and again, a rapid, a, a very high population growth on the mainland. 
So in closing, uh, it is important to emphasize that Puerto Rico, is prob Puerto Rico was already encountering a humanitarian crisis before Hurricane Maria. Uh, it was not the hurricane that brought the crisis. The hurricane made the crisis so much worse. Uh, but it was not something that just happened because you know, a Category 4 hurricane uh, went through the island. So it's imperative to rebuild Puerto Rico as soon as possible um, and to ease this humanitarian crisis that we're seeing. Uh, this crisis is causing disease, illness. We've seen fatalities as a result uh, because the longer it takes to restore electricity and basic services, uh, we're going to continue to see people, uh, the people dying. And this is causing, again, uh, so much distress among millions of our American citizens. So that concludes my presentation. Um, and, and that's only scratching the surface of what this wonderful book really includes. As I understand it, the event is being taped and broadcasted. So is it okay if I invite both of you to kind of sure, sit over here so you can take questions and, and, and be seen by the, by the audience? Um, economists are very polite types of social scientists. <laughs> <laughs> they, talk about, they, talk about, they talk about unexplained uh, 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 variation. Sociologists tend to be a little bit less polite when addressing unexplained variation. We tend to call it discrimination. Uh, because what that means is essentially people that have similar characteristics that are receiving very unequal returns for those characteristics. People that look the same that are being paid less. Again, economists very politely talk about unexplained uh, uh, variation. Sociologists may be a little bit quicker to the punch and, and say this smells uh, worse than unexplained uh, uh, variation. Um, but let me try to uh, uh, use this opportunity to uh, uh, um, try, try to put my password into my phone so I can activate my comments. <laughs> That's great. There we go. The book is timely and contemporary. Today, for example, the Financial Control Board of Puerto Rico met uh, to approve the new fiscal plan. And you may ask, what is the fiscal plan? The fiscal plan is the document that's going to essentially be the guiding document for making policy decisions that are going to impact the population of Puerto Rico for the next five years. The government presented its fiscal plan uh, with its various recipes, including a whole section on labor reforms and welfare reforms. The board today in its presentation was a lot more aggressive in terms of uh, what Puerto Rico, they thought Puerto Rico needed to do in the area of welfare and labor reform uh, 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 to, in their view, become more competitive. Puerto Rico is now going to be subjected to an at will uh, employment system, significantly reduced vacation time, significantly reduced paid sick leave time, the C Christmas bonus that, mem that, that some workers received, which essentially was a glorified savings club for very underpaid workers, uh, is now going to be taken away all under the guise of making Puerto Rico more competitive. And, and, and we heard from, uh, from Marie uh, about, and, and, and from Javi Dan's work, about the collapse of the economy and the labor market in 2006. These reforms that are being uh, uh, proposed are not being proposed because their analysis is that the problem with Puerto Rico was a collapse in the demand for labor and a collapse in the labor market. It comes from a more neocolonial analysis that the problem in Puerto Rico uh, is some problem with the labor supply, that the workforce tends to be a low-skilled workforce, that the welfare programs are too generous, Therefore, the population doesn't have an incentive to go to work and prefer somehow to stay home and receive this aid. And that these laws and regulations that protect uh, workers and, employ and employees make it too costly for, for business people and for entrepreneurs uh, to hire labor in Puerto Rico. When I say this book is timely and contemporary, I mean it because it tries to present an alternative analysis of why Puerto Rico is where it is that is uh, coming away and very different from the simplistic colonial notion that Puerto Rico's problem, in a way, is caused by uh, uh, the poverty and inequality that Puerto Ricans have been subjected to for the last uh, hundred and some years. Uh, uh, it treats the Puerto Rico population as a whole, 
making appropriate differences between nativity, island born, mainland born, making appropriate differences between place of residence, those that live on the island, those that live on the mainland. Uh, but you do discover interesting patterns between island born on the mainland and mainland born on the island. Uh, and, and if you take the time to go through the details of their data, uh, you will learn and discover a lot of uh, uh, facts about the Puerto Rican population that Marie, for example, was kind enough uh, to really go over and gives us a, a, a very multidimensional view of what's happening with the many Puerto Rican subpopulations that make the Puerto Rican population uh, as a whole. Uh, I've read many stories without data, and I'm always left wanting the data that substantiates this story. And I've read a lot of data without stories, and it leaves me trying to figure out, okay, what it does really explain it. And, <laughs> and, 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 and this book is, 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 and the accomplishment of this book uh, is that it does really innovative and nuanced analysis of data, uh, of new data sets, fresh data sets, uh, uh, with, with really uh, contemporary information interwoven with a coherent causal story about the main institutional factors, the main social factors, the main demographic factors, uh, uh, the main economic factors, and to some extent the political factors that have left significant segments of the Puerto Rican people, particularly those on the island, really further uh, behind. Uh, Javidan, uh, Marie, and, and Alberto have presented what I think up to date is the clearest articulation of Puerto Rico's demographic death spiral. What is Puerto Rico's demographic death spiral? A flat economy and, 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 and stagnant incomes and stagnant poverty rates lead to significant out-migration. Uh, 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 collapse in the labor market leads to significant out-migration. That robs the island of a valuable population and robs the state of valuable income. Then, then it has to borrow to try to make up for the for the service needs of a uh, population that's left behind, that's increasingly old, uh, and increasingly uh, under some form of vulnerability or, or another due to poverty, due to disability. Uh, 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 as this population leaves, the businesses don't make as much. Uh, the government doesn't have enough to be able to sustain itself, which means that the economy goes down, which means that more people leave, and that's the demographic death spiral that we're seeing, and it's reflected uh, very nicely in the, in the uh, uh, population pyramids that, that the authors were able to share with us. Uh, I, I, I would add that if you do look at the population pyramids for the Puerto Rican population in the U.S., you do get a somewhat different story. Mm -hmm. And the Puerto Rican population now that's migrating is a younger population. It's an a, a active population in terms of its <coughs> fertility rate. It's about double the fertility rate for the island. Uh, uh, so we ought to see very fresh and healthy growth of the Puerto Rican population in the U.S. as the one on the island seems to be aging and uh, 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 and drying up. Let me just touch before we move into the Q&A on some of the themes that the book covers, and again, not trying to be repetitive of the amazing presentation that we heard. Uh, there's a discussion about the growth and the emergence of the Puerto Rican nation, and it talks about it as a Puerto Rican nation, with the themes of economic development on the island, the exhaustion of the model, the mass migration, and the implications for population composition, both on the island and on the mainland. The amazing chapter on the perfect storm uh, uh, before the storm, uh, 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 it's rich in terms of giving us detail about exactly what happened in 2006 with the collapse of labor demand and manufacturing. And this is crucial because that was the year that a book by the Brookings Institution and the Center for the New Economy was published that anticipates some of the medicine that we're hearing today from the board around uh, Puerto Rico's minimum wage is too high, welfare benefits are too high, and these kinds of issues affect labor supply. And the timing of that book uh, was, was, was propitious in the sense that that's the year that the demand of the labor market collapsed, which from a kind of scientific perspective, I guess, proved the point that Puerto Rico's problem wasn't necessarily supply driven, but was a lot more demand driven. And the chapter goes really into a lot of detail about not just what happened and how it happened, but the implications of it. Uh, challenge is that you live by the tax break, you die by the tax break. And in the sense, I think what we're all struggling for is what is Puerto Rico's model of development that is independent on some kind of gimmick that Congress can give you and Congress can easily take away? Uh, is there a, a, a more solid uh, basis for a Puerto Rico economy that can grow, that can really serve the interest of the Puerto Rican people, which isn't something that the Puerto Rico economy has been designed, at least for the last couple of hundred years, right? When the U.S. needed sugar, Puerto Rico produced sugar. When the U.S. needed coffee, Puerto Rico produced coffee. When the U.S. needed underwear, Puerto Rico produced underwear. And when the U.S. needed pills and needed uh, IV solutions, Puerto Rico produced IV solutions. 
people in Puerto Rico used IV solutions, underwear, and sugar. Uh, but this was an economy that science started to produce the needs for the needs of the people. So maybe now is a good time to start thinking about an economy that works for the population of Puerto Rico. Um, it is really rich in the characteristics of the immigrants and the details on the migration, which is a topic that is full of mythology, this idea that there's a brain drain. Of course there's a brain drain. Every Puerto Rican that leaves is a brain. <laughs> Uh, uh, from from my perspective, but the population that leaves is exactly almost like a snapshot of the population that's on the island, and everybody's leaving from all socioeconomic sectors. And yes, there may be some overrepresentation of some technical and professional occupations. There were, after all, thirteen thousand physicians as members of the College of Physicians ten years ago, and there's nine thousand today. So clearly, there's been a loss of physicians. But to say that 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 the Puerto Rican out migration is uh, um, selected in terms of higher education levels is not, is not necessarily true. It is to the extent that younger people have more education and younger people leave. But if you age adjust, I think you come to a much more balanced perspective. And I think we should all really tell that story. Puerto migration is, is a phenomenon that affects, and especially after Maria, every single social class and social grouping on the island, every single town has lost population uh, 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 over, the last, um, over the last few years. Um, there's uh, another chapter that compares outcomes by place. Uh, and places vary by opportunity structures, by, by demography, vary by the selection and the characteristics of the immigrants and the comparison between Texas and New York and Massachusetts and uh, uh, Florida are illustrative because there are various different types of Puerto Rican populations that are moving to those places. And who they are matters and where they're going matters. And I think the book is, 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 is rich in, in terms of giving us those facts and those details. Uh, there's a chapter on gender and differences by gender in a lot of the key socioeconomic outcomes. Uh, it's an important chapter in the sense that when you look on the island, poverty is very feminized. When you look at participation in social assistance programs, uh, they're overwhelmingly women, women with young children. And when you look at the policy impacts of what's being proposed in terms of labor law and in terms of welfare law, it's going to fall heavily on the backs of poor women when they're now going to be required to work or volunteer for at least 20 hours a week. Uh, up to 80 uh, weeks in the month for what averages about $112 a month in nutritional assistance programs. So uh, 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 um, it's really uh, going back. Uh, uh, and, and, and secondly, I think when you look at data in Puerto Rico on education levels, women uh, now in Puerto Rico have much higher levels of uh, bachelor's degrees and master's degrees, have much higher human capital, but their wages and their earnings and their incomes are still lag lagging far behind in what economists may call unexplained <laughs> uh, difference, which I will aggressively call a uh, 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 glass ceiling by gender in the Caribbean and in Puerto Rico in particular, where, 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 the, where, where women's work is paid very different than men's work and where the responsibilities are definitely shared very unevenly. Uh, when you look at participation in the welfare program, uh, 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 women have about a 10% advantage in education level over men, about 10% more have a bachelor's degree and have high school degree uh, than men, uh, but about 20% of them say they can't work because they're taking primary responsibility for minor children or elderly adults. So when you impose a work requirement, it's going to really hit heavily on, on, the, on the female population in Puerto Rico. And, and again, I'm, 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 I'm grateful and thankful that the book includes our chapter where those issues are addressed directly. And the second innovation in the book is the chapter on business and small business development patterns and small business formation, because at some point, uh, the development of that entrepreneurship, uh, self-employed small business infrastructure in various uh, Puerto Rican communities is going to be key to the development of the capital base that's going to be needed to propel the community forward. Uh, there's a, a, a concluding chapter that takes talks and discusses where we are, which, which was uh, adequately summarized. There's a chapter on the various data sets that were used in the book to produce the analysis, which is going to be terrific for students that are going to use this book in their, text, uh, in their classes. There's a chapter on the methodologies that were used, which again, another very rich chapter. We hear about old and new generations of Puerto Ricans. We hear about island and mainland Puerto Rican. We hear about education differences. We hear about gender inequalities. We hear about place-related differences. We hear about population selection in the various new uh, destinations. We hear about lack of access uh, to capital for small business, all occurring in a colonial context increasingly uh, with the contradictions increasingly uh, becoming visible with a staggering depth uh, and an anemic economy. Again, we live by the tax break and we die by the tax break. And I think it's time for us to think about what the new model ought to look like. Uh, by way of conclusion, I would have perhaps liked to see a little bit more on 
explanations for the low labor force participation rate in Puerto Rico. It's a hot topic. It's a topic of great interest among the board. The book addresses it, addresses it thoughtfully, uh, but I think it leaves it more as yes, these are the prevailing explanations, and I would have liked to see uh, much more aggressive tackling of the question. Maybe in the Q&A we can come up with some fresher analysis. And again, what that's only doing is, is preparing nice terrain for future academics and analysts to weigh in on mm -hmm. important questions of what explains the low participation rate uh, in Puerto Rico. Uh, and, and, and secondly, and I think this <coughs> now kind of paying tribute to where we are, uh, we hear about all these different segmentations and categorizations of our one Puerto Rican people and one Puerto Rican nation. Uh, but I think I would have liked to see perhaps a little bit more of a, of a what we may want to call an old fashioned <laughs> class analysis of, of uh, great that we treat the entire Puerto Rican population as one mainland island. Mm -hmm. uh, now I think we need to do the class analysis of that one right. mainland island Absolutely. population. I think this, this book uh, uh, really sets up all the foundations that we need to really engage in that analysis more productively. That next wave of analysis will not have been able to be done without the foundation that this book sets in terms of, of the analysis. So, uh, 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 um, talking about inequality, talking about poverty are important topics that, that the authors do a terrific job. Um, in, this, in this chapter on um, Alberto Lopez's book on the Puerto Rican population, our mentor friend, uh, I, when I'm in this building, I always remember Frank, you know? And he wrote a chapter in a book that said, Beyond Survival. Por que seguiremos siendo Puerto Ricanos? Right here. Let's do it. And things deteriorating within that system, they're going to tend to to out -mite, to to migrate to the mainland. So the same strategies that are being used to address uh, the core economic issues in the island are going to continue to contribute uh, to the massive out migration. And so you know the demography of the island is going to be critical. Uh, as we move forward, and we've already talked significantly about that, but let me emphasize it, right? We have a, a very, uh, if you look at the demographic characteristics uh, in Puerto Rico, in terms of uh, very low levels of fertility, a very high uh, life expectancy, they reflect the demographic characteristics of a quote-unquote uh, developed country. But when you look at the economic characteristics, those don't match, right? And so the demographic processes in Puerto Rico have occurred in the opposite direction to, to the economic processes. But as you continue to have low, extremely low levels of fertility, uh, way below uh, the U.S., uh, the total fertility rates in the U.S., as you continue to have increasing uh, life expectancy, and as you continue to have massive migration to the United States, uh, the population in the quote-unquote what demographers call productive ages are less and less in Puerto Rico who are the ones that can contribute to the economic development of the island. So as that population begins to get squeezed and becomes smaller and smaller, while the uh, top heavy, as you saw the population pyramids, continues to increase, it's also going to pose major issues in terms of uh, public health health and public health, which are already taxing uh, a very critical uh, healthcare infrastructure. And one of the things that we're gonna have to look in the long term in Puerto Rico is also uh, not only the public health, but the mental health impacts of Hurricane Maria and how that is impacting the island and how uh, populations that have been living with a month, two months, three months, four months, now seven months without electricity, this will have significant public health and mental health impacts on the island, which is all tied to, to, the, to the question that you've been asking as well, Evelyn. Yeah, sure. um, I'm an HR director and I, I hire people. And last summer, I, I posted um, a number of jobs, about two dozen jobs in, in, uh, in D. And I wasn't getting people because they needed to be bilingual. It's a manufacturing site, thousands of people that work for, for me, basically. And then I get a call from Departamento de Trabajo y Recursos Humanos, Puerto Rico, because they said, well, I have the mechanics, I have the chemists that you need, I have the supply chain people that you need, and they can work for you cheaply. I never had that happen to me. I worked in Texas and a number of places where I never had the Department of Labor come to me, offering me extraordinarily highly skilled people at a much lower rate than I could find them in New York. I found that interesting because, and I did hire about 16 people from Puerto Rico. Uh, most of them had worked in um, pharmaceuticals. Um, and I found that interesting because I never expected a government entity to um, kind of work in, the, in getting people out of Puerto Rico. 
uh, assisting the out-migration, if you will. So, um, so my question is, I don't know if it's a question, but the role of government entities in Puerto Rico is, is quite surprising. I still get calls about summer intern. I prefer to hire kids from my alma mater instead of going to Puerto Rico, but they're very persistent knowing that um, uh, they have people. And I hear from colleagues in other industries, HR managers, who are getting an, uh, the same. They're calling us to, to hire their, the people in Puerto Rico, which contributes to the flight of highly skilled people. And it begs the question, how is Puerto Rico going to recover if the government's assisting in the flight out of Puerto Rico? If you want to go to the library of the center, there's a PhD dissertation by a gentleman by the name of Michael Lapp from many years ago. That's an analysis of the uh, of the Migration Division of Puerto Rico's Department of Labor that has historically, since the 30s, or if not earlier, been instrumental in facilitating the migration of workers from Puerto Rico. Uh, at a time when they weren't even perceived to be citizens, they were issuing ID cards and things of that nature and facilitating contract negotiations with employers. Um, one would hope that, uh, it's interesting that they use the cheap labor argument, and one would hope that when they get here and you realize that they're very skilled labor, that one would think their wages would be comparable to the wages paid to other workers Absolutely. doing the same work, you know? So perhaps it can be a win-win uh, if it works, but let me let the panelists kind of answer, and I think everybody had a comment on this very issue also. Well, so, and, uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, but this is an interesting comment because just this week I was talking to um, uh, to a number of colleagues who uh, are seeing an uptick in uh, for-profit agencies who are going to Puerto Rico and their primary job is to uh, get highly educated uh, Puerto Ricans on the island in a diverse number uh, of uh, fields and uh, train them and facilitate the process uh, for their transition from Puerto Rico to, to the U.S. mainland, right? So their sole, goal, sole purpose is to get these folks, get them uh, prepared, and sort of set the, the strategy to move them uh, to employment opportunities uh, throughout, the, throughout, the mainland, uh, throughout the mainland. So, the, uh, so this is becoming a critical issue. Even in our uh, Rico that I mentioned, and I won't mention the, the, uh, the university, but you know, there, there were colleagues of ours saying, we are now uh, in the job, sort of being facetious about this, in training and graduating students uh, with a bachelor's degree who are now going to be employed, gainfully employed by the state of Texas. And so because all their students practically were being educated in Puerto Rico, getting a four-year degree, and being immediately uh, recruited for the state of Texas, right? Again, this goes back to the question Edwin was asking before. Uh, if we continue to educate these individuals, and through these types of agencies or through other recruitment processes, uh, they're being taken from you know uh, Puerto Rico to a variety of other areas because you know. As you already know, uh, schools in Puerto Rico are, are closing left and right, right? From uh, primary to high school, they're just closing left and right because the demographic uh, uh, trends are not allowing for uh, really being able to uh, supply kids to, to these schools. And so there is a lack of jobs in Puerto Rico, and there are agencies that really are taking advantage of this to make sure that they uh, transition, successfully uh, transition these individuals to uh, to the mainland. Unfortunately, what our data shows is that despite uh, the high levels of skill, when we compare them to the overall population, uh, there's a significant differential uh, in terms of uh, income. Thank you. Edwin, you wanted to comment? Yeah, no, uh, there, there is a recent book uh, that is called Sponsor Migration by Gabriel Melendez. True. <laughs> <laughs> and a wonderful uh, radio interview in Aníbal Acevedo Vilas Radio Isla program. Just, it's on just the podcast. addresses this topic, you know, way back perspective. But what is interesting, though, is the dilemma that the Puerto Rican uh, people live right now. Think about this: in the university, we have this argument. Why would you support Puerto Rican UPR students coming to the U.S. because you are and the administration there opposes that, right? So think about this. What is our role here, faculty, right? If they get here, we gotta serve them, right? But think about the, the public employee that is pushing those people to HR 
what is motivating them? It's the the hardship that these people are living with, you know, two, three part-time employments at 10 bucks an hour, eight bucks an hour. So think about it from that perspective, right? Now, yeah, what is the problem? And I, I would make an argument for this is a structural issue, right? Because you have people, a new economy on agriculture. The government has land. The cooperatives have money, right? But there's no matching to create, you know, to support that, that entrepreneurship in agriculture. Instead of pushing these people out, why don't we try to train them to stay with businesses there? And even Presario's class, right? Mm -hmm. Think about Maya West, your alma mater. They gathered 500 chemical engineers for an industry that is disappearing and shrinking since 2006. Those people come to Texas and to other places where they will be employed. Three jobs open in, in, in uh, you know, so what is, what is the college doing to create engineers that will stay and create jobs in Puerto Rico? In, in gene therapies or any other thing? What is the connection between industry? It is, it is a, a more systemic problem. Because if you look at the micro and the individual, you have to support people that are without jobs. You gotta do whatever you do. Therefore, you're, they call to your thing, right? But why is it that we think about that option instead of creating jobs, changing structurally, what the hell's going on here? I, 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 you know, you tell me. You, 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 you the president. You have to read the entire book. I think you did a couple of times. Well, I think I heard very enough. You know, that, that, that I'm going to say, but in five chapters. Uh, yes, sir. Yes. Oh, um, the informal economy in Puerto Rico is, a, is, uh, is, is, is substantial from my anecdotal experience. <clears throat> One of the biggest parts of that industry, of that economy, is the, is the fiesta. I call it the fiesta uh, economy, which, uh, from a consumer standpoint, stimulates a lot of jobs and stimulates a lot of income. It's very entrepreneurial. So I'm wondering, in your analysis, did you uh, delve into that? Uh, I know there's a lot of uh, informal uh, bartering of services and bartering of, of goods. Um, so that, that's, that's, uh, that's part of it. And also, I'm wondering, have you done any, have you looked into the impact of remittances that uh, come out of out migration, right? So uh, people, I've heard, the, again, anecdotally, people are leaving the island uh, simply just to make money so that they can send back, so they can stabilize, and then be able, to, because a lot of, I guess, professionals would take a, a lesser salary to live on the island than to live. So I'm wondering what kind of an analysis of, have you done on that that segment of, of that that particular big industry which Puerto Rico has, uh, which uh, I, you know? So the informal economy, fiestas patronales, yeah, right, exactly. and, uh, and remittances. Yeah. Okay. So unfortunately, it's very difficult to get data on the informal economy. As you mentioned, uh, there's a lot of anecdotal evidence on that. Um, the book that Hector mentioned, the 2006, the Brookings Institute. Institution. One of the chapters there, they did the authors did do a survey in terms of the informal economy and how that was a, how that might be affecting the labor force participation rate. That perhaps the LFP rate's low because it's not that people are not working; they're just not working in, in formal uh, formal employment. Books, right. um, but I, they only came up with a, I don't remember the exact like three or four percentage points uh, that they could explain. Uh, but there could certainly be much more going on. Unfortunately, we didn't have the the data to be able to dig into that. With respect to remittances, um, that is not an issue that we could get into. Again, a lot of it had to do with uh, missing or, or not having the data to be able to analyze that. I think that certainly moving forward, because we've had now more than a decade of this massive net out migration, uh, hopefully there'll be other sources of data that we could get to, to tap into that. Again, right now what we see is a lot of anecdotal evidence, but not anything, any hard numbers. On remittances, I think Mexico gets about north of 20 billion. The DR gets north of 5 billion. I think the last estimates I saw for Puerto Rico were about a billion. 
but it's very difficult to do the accounting because if yeah. your mom calls you to order something on Amazon and send it, and <laughs> yeah, how yeah. does that really count? And in Puerto Rico, there's a lot of that kind of back and forth movement. You you pay someone's college bill or someone pays this right. bill or there's an account in Banco Popular that has a user over there and a user over here. So keeping track of the of the details may be somewhat more daunting. But I think definitely Post Maria, there's an incredible flow of resources moving right. back and forth. That may explain part of that uh, low labor force participation rate. Because imagine a scenario where there's say four brothers and sisters, and there's mom and dad over there, right? right? There's three brothers and sisters working in the US, and then there's one sister that stayed with mom and dad taking care of them, maybe not working in the formal economy, but being sustained perhaps by the work of the two or three other brothers and sisters while they're doing family care, but which is taking care of the elder folks, right? That's, you know, I mean, so, so that may count as low labor force participation, but I don't think it's less economic activity from any kind of uh, realistic sense, right? Uh, there's a lot of hands, so let's keep trying to yeah, take yeah, great yeah, questions. Yeah, no. absolutely. Thank you very much. Your explanation was beautiful. I really learned a lot about Puerto Rico. And my question is more um, the role of government. Um, how much can we say that the economy in Puerto Rico has been lagging behind because of government? Um, I, I, I look at this. Um, debt in Puerto Rico is very high. And um, I mean, big spending taxation is incredible. And, and how much um, governments can do? I, I, I think uh, the economy of Puerto Rico is more similar to the economy of any Latin American country than the, the, the United States. Mm -hmm. Thus, the um, natural market for Puerto Rico might be the, the United States, but also the Caribbean. So I think we need implement a policies that uh, incentivize the strength of the market might be good for Puerto Rico. Um, and I'm asking about the, the, the government because I was in Mexico a couple of months ago and I was looking at the government. So uh, the Secretary of uh, Foreign Affairs is the son of the former president. The governors of many states are the sons of previous governors. So um, I don't know. I, it, it, it seems to me that it's more like uh, fighting the political class that is keeping Puerto Rico behind. I don't know. I, 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 I hope you can give me some clues about that. Uh, yeah, it so happens that in Puerto Rico, the current governor is the son of a former <laughs> <laughs> governor. I was watching the news in the hurricane, and the first thing I, I learned is that the, 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 the current governor is the son of some how relative of a previous governor. So the political class Probably. Kind of like in New York. Yes, yes, no, certainly. No, I think that there are two questions there. There's a, there's a political uh, party control of the government apparatus question, and then there's a broader political economy. Is the size of Puerto Rico's government too big? Which some people have, in fact, argued that it's too much of a command and control economy and, and too little of a market economy. Some people would actually say the opposite, right? It's too much of a a uh, uh, capital-driven economy and maybe less for the people-driven economy, but I'll let you weigh in, what do you think? No, that's a very good question, um, and there's not an, an easy answer. Um, I think it's one of those things that's all of the above uh, in terms of uh, what some of the issues are. Um, I didn't mention it in terms of one of the impediments to Puerto Rico, it's actually, it, it is actually related to politics, and that is that Puerto Rico does not have representation in Congress. Um, and I think that is a big issue that um, I probably should add a bullet point to our slides about that because um, I think that's been one of the issues why Puerto Rico has been left behind with respect to a lot of, at least, you know, federal policies that have been put into place that Puerto Rico just would not have that, the voting representation and the voice uh, that would make uh, policymakers be more accountable uh, to the island's well-being. Yeah, and I, I would actually argue that the, you know, this discussion about the political class uh, in Puerto Rico is not any different than the political class uh, in the United States. Actually, I would say it's much more like the United States and less like, uh, you know, uh, Latin America or Central America. Uh, and, you know, so I, I just don't see, and I, some of you may, may disagree with that, but uh, there is not, there's not this, you know, political dynasty, if you will, in Puerto Rico. Some folks have described Puerto Rico as being now a victim between an absentee Congress, 
a captive political class and a rentier elite. And that those are the three dominant sectors and Puerto Rico's like a hostage with a gun to its head from all those three sectors. So it'll be interesting to see how we could possibly come out of it. Carlos, did you have your hand up? Yes, yes, I did. Thank you. And thank you, Maurice. Thank you for having them for a wonderful what is going to become a major breakfast food for us now to do analysis on the Puerto Rican situation and Puerto Rican regulation, etc. Thank you for that. Uh, but uh, I want to share with you a dilemma that I have uh, that you to some extent have alluded to in, in your presentation. Uh, just like you and Edwin and what you call the scholars, uh, we explain that crisis, the, 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 the post-2006 crisis in Puerto Rico to some extent uh, by marking the, the end of the phase out of Section 936. Uh, but in looking at evidence from the Government Development Bank, Roberto, uh, you know, you, you look at their uh, index of economic activity, uh, you still see that index of economic activity climbing through that period of 1996 to 2006, you know, peaking at 2006, 5, 6, and then declining up until uh, recent. So, so even though it's, it's not like when all the industries left right in 2006, I mean, I, as you pointed out, you know, there were 37,000 jobs that, you know, began to disappear throughout that period. Yet, according to the development bank, you know, their economic activity index kept going up, and that tracked very closely with the gross domestic product. So, what happened? You know, certainly there was an impact, and there is an impact uh, 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 of that declining uh, industry, uh, either because they were cutting down the, the uh, workforce or because they were uh, exiting Puerto Rico altogether, and as well, as you pointed out, the, the reduction in capital, yet for that period of 10 years, you see an increase in economic activity in Puerto Rico. What would account for that? That is a very good question. Um, I would want to take a look a little bit more uh, at the data for that. Um, since there was a phase out period, the businesses that were operating on the island were still getting the tax credits. Uh, they just knew that there was an expiration for when those tax credits would uh, would end up uh, would end up going away. Um, it may also be that some of the businesses that did scale back. In our estimates, the thirty-seven thousand was after two thousand, or starting in two thousand six and forward. Uh, we were looking, or some of the other estimates we had, the thirty thousand jobs lost before then, uh, were based on other sources of data and, uh, and other authors in terms of what the industries were doing. It could be that some were still operating very efficiently um, and maybe I've let some of the workers, some of those workers go but continue to operate. In, and we, we have seen that a little bit in terms of what has been happening on the U.S. mainland with respect to the jobs re of the recovery after the last recession, uh, where a lot of businesses, we've, you know, we had positive economic growth, but it hasn't been until very recently that we've seen the turnaround in employment. And what may be happening is that the businesses that stayed may have been letting some of the workers go at the same time, increasing their efficiency or having you know, this having fewer workers but doing more work, uh, and that would account for the you know the high increase or the increase in productivity per worker, uh, while at the same time we see a, a loss of jobs. That's a very good question, and it's something that it would is, be worth exploring. It is, and during the during the ten year phase out period, there was still some borrowing, uh, debt driven growth. Of uh, uh, 2006, you have about 1.3 million workers in the economy. Right now, you're about between 900,000 and a million. Uh, you may have lost 37 to 40,000 in manufacturing, but every time someone had a birthday party or someone, you know, I'm serious, they hired someone from the town to do the party. So the spillover effects of those 37,000 manufacturing direct jobs can give you easily 150,000 jobs lost. And then, then in 2007, 8, you hit the US recession. And that basically put the last nail in Puerto Rico's economy's coffin because the U.S. recovered after the recession, Puerto Rico mm -hmm. kept tanking. So it was like the face out of 936, one punch, the recession, the second punch. And by that point, it's too late. I mean, that's kind of my sense of where the timing of some of those things has been. But it's a topic of hot debate because you're absolutely right that there were too many, on too many sides, favoring the face out of 936. And all of a sudden, there's a half of the folks that are going like, oops, did we really like make a mistake here from a policy perspective in suggesting that face up because it really has had a humongous effect on the economy and really hasn't been able to recover from it. Uh, so maybe politics got really ahead of the economics on that one. Uh, and, it, and it's a challenge that we're still perhaps living with. Uh, but, but the argument that you, you live by the tax break, you die by the tax breaks is also still true. 
Congress could possibly come up with some other gimmick that can inflate Puerto Rico's growth for a couple of years, but some new Congress can come in and say, well, you know, you're living off of the taxpayers' dollars with the subsidy. We want the money for ourselves, and now goes the political economy again. So people are trying to look for something that's a little bit more durable as an engine of growth. And I cannot <coughs> tell you that I know that people have found it. I think right now everybody's kind of looking to see, they talk about education tourism, they talk about medical tourism, they talk about just the general tourism sector, uh, uh, they talk about a little bit more uh, kind of new economy, software development. There's a whole bunch of uh, crypto pirates uh, settling down there trying to think about, okay, maybe that's the new opportunity in this kind of weird financial instrument world. Uh, uh, so, it's, it's, so it's not clear at all what's happening uh, over, overall. Yes? Yeah. Uh, uh on that 936, uh, I guess I understand that the um, government taxed 10% uh, of the profits of the company. And during this period, there was a lot of transfer pricing, which is one of the fallouts of 936 that the US Congress saw a lot of companies kind of transfer pricing um, their, um, I don't know, patents. The patents they moved them to Puerto Rico as a tax haven. Um, and then after uh, the elimination of 936, they couldn't, they, uh, they lost that huge revenue. And, um, you know, they all went to Ireland, basically. Yeah. But, uh, but I wanted to ask you, um, what do you see uh, Puerto Rico's comparative advantage being? Uh, uh, do we still have a comparative advantage in pharmaceuticals? <coughs> and then the, uh, you know, or, you know, are we, are, is, is our future in our tourism? Uh, mm -hmm. And then the other thing I wanted to ask you, but maybe that's not as closely related to the book, but um, it did, uh, about the underclass, that was mentioned before, um, in terms of education, the quality of education, um, I grew up in Puerto Rico. Anybody who had a cent would send their kid to a private school because the public schools were not good, especially, no, I'm not talking about the university, I'm talking about primary school, middle school, high school. So I mean, you create an underclass. Is there any, you know, is there, has, did you, have you seen anything that, you know, explains a little bit why some people are falling so behind. Uh, could the education system be an explanation for that underclass? And I, I, as a matter of fact, everybody knows that the, the kids who go to the University of Puerto Rico are not the poorest kids in Puerto Rico. They go to the paying university. So the subsidy actually is somewhat going to the well-off, to the middle class and upper middle class, because they, the poor people, they don't have the scores to get into the University of Puerto Rico. So it's a very complicated story but with the, the underclass. And you know, Hurricane Maria, for example, I understand it, people who live in shanty towns, which they, they are the people who lost their home. But FEMA has come out and said, you don't have papers for this property, so you can't claim anything. So I think they, you know, what have you found? What created this un about the underclass? What do you, what do you come out as like the policy implications for the underclass in Puerto Rico? That's an excellent question. <laughs> um, we we uh, again a lot of our focus was on the working age population. Uh, I think it would be very much worthwhile to also take another look at the, the younger population, see what's happening with the education system. Um, we did not have in our book we don't address the issue of the quality of education. Uh, there's anecdotal evidence uh, that is out there about the the wide variation in quality. Um, we don't get too much into that in terms of our book itself. Um, I'm very passionate about issues related to the quality of education. The reason why I became an economist is because I was very concerned about issues related to the quality of education when looking at students in the, in the same school district getting very different types of, of schooling. I think that's very well uh, worth pursuing. And I think this is, a, this is one of those critical issues that needs significant much, uh, significant much more study, if you will, uh, particularly now with the changes in uh, the closure of schools throughout the island. Uh, that's critical. That's going to impact the educational process with the 
significant out-migration of school teachers uh, to the mainland that's also going to continue to, uh, to impact the educational process uh, in Puerto Rico. So Puerto Rico really has to take a systematic and critical look at its uh, educational infrastructure and do significant modifications to address the issues that the island that the, that the island is confronting, right? Even when you look at not only the public school system, but the University of Puerto Rico system as well. I mean, I think you're right, but I think there's a lot of uh, folks with uh, that come from low-income uh, households that do go to the University of Puerto Rico system. Maybe not the UP, right, uh, in Rio Piedras, but throughout uh, the University of Puerto Rico system. I mean, there is a significant number of students in those systems that are, are from also from uh, lower income. But you know, when when you the question is, how do you really define the underclass in Puerto Rico with the uh, you know with half of the population or more uh, is below uh, the levels of poverty, right? How do you define the underclass in Puerto Rico with the high uh, unemployment rate and low labor force participation rates? How do you define uh, the underclass in Puerto Rico with the increasing number of single mothers uh, who are raising uh, their kids with all the connotations that that has in terms of the economic development, right? So I think it's a, it's a great question. It's a complicated question, and I don't think we, we we systematically address that issue uh, in our book, maybe that's volume two, right? 46% uh, of Puerto Rico's population is below poverty, 26% is below half of the poverty line, or below $6,000 a year on the one hand. It's been pretty flat for the last 15 years in terms of progress has been stalled. Um, in, on the income side, about uh, the bottom 20% make about 1% of all the income. The next 20% make about 8% of all the income. The bottom 40% make about 9% of all the income. The top 20% make 55% of all the income. The top 5% make 25% of all the income. So there's a huge poverty problem, an underclass problem, and there's a huge overclass problem in Puerto Rico too, in terms of capture of resources and not distribution. And Puerto Rico's poverty rate is double the poorest U.S. state, okay. but its ability to access the full uh, arsenal of what's left of the U.S.'s anti-poverty programs mm -hmm. is very limited because of caps on some of the major programs. So whereas there's a perception that the welfare state of Puerto Rico is generous, given its very high poverty level of 46% overall, 58% for children, it's in fact way underfunded, and Puerto Rico fights poverty with one hand tied behind its back as opposed to with the entirety of the full federal arsenal of uh, anti-poverty programs. So there's likely debate about the size of the underclass, the policies that uh, are under effectiveness in terms of addressing poverty in Puerto Rico. I'm on the side that says we really haven't had a, a, a fight against poverty in Puerto Rico yet. But we have our income maintenance programs that keep you at subsistence level and keep you trapped at subsistence level, but we don't really have uh, the kinds of programs that will propel people out of poverty. We don't have the kinds of opportunities that, 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 and, and, and jobs that are the best anti-poverty programs. But maybe as a moderator, I over editorialized. I know our time is running out. Uh, um, I'm gonna take maybe one more lingering question that was up, and maybe if there are any final comments, and then I'll wrap it up. And we can proceed for a little bit of a social time and uh, more closely thanking our terrific authors and panelists. Yeah. Sure. So it sounds like the economic Creating or bringing economic resiliency to Puerto Rico. Can I hear you? Sure. It sounds like bringing economic resiliency to Puerto Rico, riding the ship, is a pretty daunting task. If each of you had to pick one single federal policy change that could happen, that which would it be that would bring the most impact to Puerto Rico? That is a really terrific way to answer <laughs> a great, great question. To have our panelists focus and hone in on a, a particular policy initiative. So I'll let you answer that and. Um, provide our, our audience members any final parting calls you may have? Uh, one, I, it would have to be policies related to developing the infrastructure for more jobs. Um, that is the most critical, to me that's one of the most critical issues facing the island is whether or not there are uh, well-paying and sustained jobs. The structure of the island itself uh, in terms of its labor market has lacked that. And the concern with respect to the, the phasing out of the, the, the tax credits were designed to essentially help build that infrastructure for the, the high paying manufacturing jobs. By pulling that, then we've seen a loss of those jobs. I don't know if it's necessarily bringing, the t bringing tax credits back, but it's certainly uh, policies. Policies, in my view, should be designed to focus on restructuring the labor markets of the jobs that are available on the island. President Rodriguez. 
You know, and, and, and this is not a, a cop-out uh, answer to the question, but given the complexities of the issues uh, that confront Puerto Rico these days, whether it be from health and public health, whether it be the demographic factors, whether it be the educational factors uh, from uh, primary to secondary uh, to uh, uh, institutions of higher education, given the uh, employment uh, issues that come from Puerto Rico, and given the infrastructural issues that I, I discussed before, I don't think there is a single uh, federal uh, policy change uh, that will uh, significantly impact Puerto Rico. I think this is going to have to be a holistic approach, really focusing on what are the critical issues uh, that impact the island, and really just radically transforming uh, a number of the federal policies that directly deal uh, with the issues of Puerto Rico. Uh, more importantly, I think that the future of the island of Puerto Rico really resides with the 5.3 million Puerto Ricans that are, are on the mainland. Uh, I think that the, uh, the nature, uh, the economic development of this population, uh, the political influence, the political changes that we can have here on the mainland are going to be significantly more important than any federal policy change uh, that you may have. So I really do believe uh, that the future of Puerto Rico in terms of uh, its economic development and changes in the policies uh, that impact the island uh, to a large extent are going to reside uh, on the political influence, mobilization, active engagement and participation of the 5.3 Puerto Ricans that reside on the mainland. Please join me in thanking our... <laughs> I understand that there is a flyer that has information so you can request the book at a discount. And uh, uh, please do, because it is a really terrific piece of work. Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you.